Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to uh, worship today. This uh, the fifth Sunday after Epiphany, uh, first Sunday of February also, so we uh, pray together uh, divine service setting in one. That's page 151, page 151. Start out our service by singing in 907, 907. <laughs> Christ, 
and by his authority. I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We speak together the introits. The introits is printed on the back of our balloon. O oh God, be not far from me. O oh God, make haste to help me. With the mighty deeds of the Lord God, I will come. I will remind them of your righteousness, yours alone. O oh God, for my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O oh God, do not forsake me, until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those to come. Glory be to the Father.
Lord, keep your family, the church, continually in the true faith, that relying on the hope of your heavenly grace, we may ever be defended by your mighty power. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
And when he had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish. And their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now, now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their nets, their boats to land, they left everything and followed Jesus. This is the Gospel of the Lord. our Christian faith as we speak the Nicene Creed. We say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in the world Jesus Christ, your only Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and is
Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <coughs> Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God the Father and from the Lord and the Savior Jesus. <coughs> Dear friends in Christ, when, uh, when I was in high school, I once had a Pentecostal preacher tell me that Lutherans are not true Christians. Now, mind you, at that point, I played an organ every Sunday in church, and I had gone through four years of confirmation. I memorized a small catechism, and yet I was being told that none of that was good enough to be a Christian, to be a true believer, and to follow Christ. No, what Lutherans were lacking, according to that Pentecostal preacher, is the speaking in tongues. And since our church didn't have the gift of tongues, then our church didn't have the Holy Spirit. And if the Lutheran church didn't have the Holy Spirit, then it couldn't be the true Christian church. Now that was at a Prince church for a youth event that happened. And the preacher was trying to get me to heed an altar call and rededicate my life to Jesus and his true faith and unlock my gift of tongues. But the worst part of what that Pentecostal preacher was telling me, I guess other than saying that the church I belonged to and went to regularly would get me into heaven along with millions of other Christians throughout the world who didn't speak in tongues. No, the worst thing about what he said is that he was making the gift of tongues the gift of the Spirit, he was making it into a work we can do to be made righteous. Did you catch that? Here's the logic. If you speak in tongues, which is a spiritual gift described in the scriptures that we have to deal with, if you speak in tongues, then you have the Holy Spirit. So, do you know what the kind of logic encourages people to do? What encourages them to speak in tongues? Without any idea what they are saying, or at worst just doing it for show. So today we have to talk about speaking in tongues. Not because I want to talk about it, but because that is what the Holy Scriptures reveal to us today. First of all, we have to acknowledge that speaking in tongues is indeed a gift given to the church by the Holy Spirit. It is one of them listed when Paul writes in chapter 12 about the gifts of the Spirit. He says, these are some of the gifts of the Spirit. He says, wisdom and knowledge and faith and healing and miracles and prophecy and distinguishing spirits, tongues and interpretation of tongues. But here's the thing about this verse from chapter 12. This list of gifts isn't exhaustive, meaning that cannot possibly be all of the gifts of the Spirit. And Paul knew that when he wrote. Also, Paul most likely wrote these specifically because they are what is going on in the church at Corinth, the place that he was writing this letter to. In fact, Paul writes so much about speaking in tongues in 1 Corinthians 
because the Corinthians have a problem with speaking in tongues. And what is that problem? Well, they're using speaking in tongues. You know, this sounds kind of juvenile. But they're using it to show off. It'd be like one guy would stand up in church and he would start speaking gibberish and then he'd sit down. And then another guy over there would stand up and speak louder and longer than the first guy to show off that he had more spirit than that guy. And that really is the problem at the church in Corinth. Well, one of many, mind you. The misuse of the gifts of the Spirit in order to show off, in order to look better than the next guy. And so this leads Paul to warn them and to warn us as the church of today about how we treat the speaking of tongues and other gifts of the Spirit because they certainly are not given to us to work ourselves into heaven. So Paul starts off, this is verse 5. So this comes before what we have in our epistle reading. Verse 5 of chapter 4, right, Paul writes, Now I want you all to speak in tongues. How about that? All of you. Paul writes, I want all of you to do it. But my favorite words, but even more I want you to prophesy. So we hear that today, and we scratch our heads that, again, Paul wants us to speak in tongues? But notice that that's not the main point of that sentence. But even more, he says, prophesy. He goes on in verse 6. He says this, Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? And he's right. What is speaking in tongues good for? Especially if no one understands. And so it all culminates with the reading read moments ago from chapter 14, verse 12 says this, So with yourselves, so since you are eager for the manifestation of the Spirit, Paul says, strive to excel in building up the church. There's the whole point of every spiritual gift. Might I venture to say that is the undoing of speaking in tongues in the Christian church from then on. See, what did Paul say should be accomplished by gifts given to us by the Spirit? It is to measure who it, or is it, mind you, is it measured to, to who is more important then someone based on how much Holy Spirit someone has, as if we all have a little gauge maybe attached to our neck that shows how much Holy Spirit each of us have. Oh, a little low on the Holy Spirit, I better speak in tongues? No. Spiritual gifts are meant for the building up of the church. Interestingly enough, there are generally uh, three camps in the Christian church today about the speaking of tongues. The first camp would be like that Pentecostal preacher I mentioned. People who believe speaking nonsensical things is a mark of being a Christian. The second camp of people on that of speaking in tongues are those who hold that speaking in tongues has ceased to exist in the Christian church. 
because it's no longer necessary. And the Holy Spirit never has promised to give the same gifts at all times and in all places. And the last and the third camp are those who say that speaking in tongues now refers to speaking in other known languages that you may you want to understand. In fact, Martin Luther accuses the Catholic Church of speaking in tongues as they have their church services in Latin. Luther wrote that they were harming the church because they never had a Latin interpreter in, uh, to build up the poor German peasants that went to church and had no idea what was going on. So what about us today? Well, I really wish I could find that Pentecostal preacher and have a discussion with him today. Because I might be a little more intimidating today than I was as a 100-pound high school kid. And I certainly know a whole lot more now. But I'd like to bring to his attention that spiritual gifts are meant to build up the church. And Paul clearly says that speaking in tongues really doesn't do that. What would be, or what would someone make of Paul's words if they really looked at them and played out their logic? Can they say that churches that don't speak in tongues really don't have the Holy Spirit? Even though the scripture promises, Jesus says, wherever his words are spoken, there the Spirit is working. Well, my friends in Christ, I'm a Missouri Synod Lutheran for a good reason. I will never, ever say that people can or can't go to heaven in other churches, because really that is for God to decide. But I will say, but what I will say is that it is easiest to get into heaven based on the teaching of this church you are in right now. And we understand spiritual gifts to be a blessing and not a burden. Just imagine if I required you all to make sure that you heal someone before you go to heaven. Because healing is a spiritual gift. And yet, none of you are medical doctors. See, that is the spiritual gift that medical doctors have. The gift of healing. But what would you think if I said that you all have to perform a miracle before receiving forgiveness of Christ? Because remember, performing miracles is a spiritual gift. The only miracle I've ever performed is probably duping my wife into marrying me. <laughs> the point is that you all know what you are good at. You all know what your spiritual gifts are. It is whatever you can do whatever you can accomplish, offer support to build up this congregation. So for example, for Maryland, it's playing organ faithfully Sunday after Sunday. I have the spiritual gift of preaching, a gift that many of you are glad that you don't have to do. Some of you have the gift of taking care of our buildings with your handyman know-how. Many of you help with Sunday school. And most of you exercise your spiritual gifts without even knowing it. As you rally around your beloved church to make sure that we are blessed, that we are faithful, that we take care of our members, 
and that all people would find this place as a place of the free forgiveness of sins found only in Jesus. And you can't say that clearly enough in tongues. Amen. And I may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding. God, our hearts and minds are the one true faith. Moving into life everlasting. Amen. We now take a moment to worship our God with our tithes and offerings. Do not forsake us nor, uh, nor the generation to come. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, never depart from us, though we are unworthy of you and your bounty. You are pleased to receive our meager thanks and reluctant obedience for the sake of Christ's perfect obedience. Let your word rule us and your spirit revive us to leave behind pride and anxiety alike, that we may follow you in all we do, to the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Continue on page 160, page 160, as we continue for the service of the sacrament. <coughs> The Lord be with you. of our mortal nature, you have manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with the angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we ought to magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and saying,
Welcome to the Lord's table. Take me the true body of the Lord Jesus Christ, given in death to you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Take me the true body of the Lord Jesus Christ, given in death to you for the forgiveness of all your sins.
page 164. We sing as we sing, thank the Lord. Close the last year, 507. 507. 